So yeah, thanks for joining uh, the um, Jenkins Contributor Summit again. Today we have a discussion about uh, security, uh, Jenkins delivery pipelines. And, and um, uh, two days ago we briefly discussed topics we would like to cover. So uh, firstly, problems we experience with plugins, then uh, what could we do, including uh, taking a look at the job 229 from JC. Um, and uh, yeah, then looking into our pipelines and uh, discussing uh, uh, how we want to improve them and uh, what infrastructure we need for that. Uh, for me, the main outcome uh, for this uh, session would be a list of initiatives we would like to plan for the next uh, year and uh, which we would to put on the, uh, the roadmap. And uh, if you could also build consensus about how we want uh, to address uh, the security concern for delivery, um, it would be great. Could you explain what the security concerns are? I thought that the chip explains very nicely uh, how the infrastructure works. You mean uh, 229? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so long story short, currently developers uh, release from uh, their own machines and from their own automation setups. Uh, what it means is that uh, we basically trust maintainers uh, to build uh, uh, the components properly, including plugins and libraries available within Jenkins. Yes, uh, the Jenkins core itself uh, is built uh, by automation environment, but uh, even in the Jenkins core, we include components, let's say Jenkins models or libraries like uh, annotation lib, which is built locally. And finally, it means that, uh, yeah, assuming that uh, a developer machine gets compromised, uh, potentially you may get uh, uh, compromised uh, Jenkins core or a Jenkins plugin. And uh, this is uh, one of the main concerns which uh, was raised uh, at the previous contributor summits. And um, the idea was that we actually need to automate um, the built environment so that uh, we could uh, do releases from a controlled uh, space so that uh, we do not uh, rely on developer machines for doing that. JEP229 addresses, or what, well, I don't th I think I'm missing something. Well, JEP229 is for continuous delivery, uh, but yes, it's also, it also provides automation. So JEP229 uh, can be one of the answers. So JEP229 basically says that we would be delivering uh, pipelines from, uh, sorry, Jenkins components from GitHub Actions, right? Yes. Yeah, the motivation section mm -hmm. talks about, I mean, it certainly talks about uh, use of local builds as opposed to builds via automation. But yeah, it is just one particular approach to doing this. There are certainly lots of other approaches that are possible. This, this one seemed like the path of least resistance given the infrastructure that we had available to us, basically. So um, Jesse, just um, a quick question. Uh, if I understand Oleg's concerns correctly, um, the idea is we want essentially the developer laptop independent um, release environment of JEP229, but mm -hmm. perhaps don't uh, also want a solution for people who might not be uh, comfortable with this model of if you merge a PR, um, it will automatically be released. Uh, wouldn't that be something that can be configured in the uh, GitHub action workflow definition to say, well, don't trigger on merge or something along those lines so that we still have largely parity on the infrastructure and tooling and all of that, but it requires a click on the GitHub UI rather than just the merge. Yeah, the, the default setup, if you go through the docs and literally copy and paste the default workflow definition, 
is going to have the behavior that you have a choice of manual merge, of, of um, manual deploy or automatic deploy upon push, but only if the current, only if the change log includes at least one change in a user facing category, like bug enhancement type of thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea there, I think I talked about that, some of the motivation is just that mm -hmm. I at least have often seen the case where, you know, somebody files a pull request and then it goes through a lot of review cycles and finally gets approved and then somebody merges it and then three and a half months pass and they post a comment on GitHub like, by the way, I actually needed this for some reason, could you please do a release and then it's another it's another process for the maintainer to go and look that up and get everything ready and do a release or something so the idea was to the continuous delivery part of the motivation is to avoid that delay but yeah it, you can you can simply comment out the push trigger if you don't want any automated releases in which case you still have the GitHub Actions has the workflow dispatch where you go into the Actions tab of the repository and click, you know, you click on CD and you click run, and then it starts up a push at that point. But if I understand correctly, if we put the configuration at the GitHub organization level, then the plugin maintainer does not have that customization, right, on this you, specific you, plugin. You can't. GitHub Actions doesn't have that kind of, as far as I know, it doesn't have anything that lets you do this sort of thing at the organization level. It's per repository configuration. Mm -hmm. okay. I also it's don't think share configurations if needed. Share secrets. Well, um, yeah, but the point is we don't want the secrets to be shared for one thing because we want the fine grained permissions control. And the other thing is, um, people need to be aware that this is happening. So setting it up on an organization level for the existing Jenkins CI org with 2000 plugins that we have is simply impractical. Yeah, no, it's definitely something you have to opt into for several reasons. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we went uh, into details uh, for job two to nine. Uh, maybe before we proceed, it makes sense to ask whether is everyone up to speed with job two to nine, or should we return back and uh, uh, to provide some introduction so that uh, everyone can participate in this discussion? I read most some of the stuff, plenty of stuff to read there. So that's for me, guys. Okay. Yeah. So for me, JEP 229 is one of potential uh, implementations we could use. One main concern is that uh, doing releases from GitHub Actions is probably not something we would like to see in the Jenkins uh, project. Well, it's a uh, low resistance pass, uh, nobody argues. Uh, GitHub Actions is great for various kinds of automation. At the same time, we are talking about the Jenkins project. So for me, I would rather like to see the final implementation done by Jenkins. Are you paying for the operation of that? Yeah, so it actually, it actually does use Jenkins for the CI part. So the deploy phase deliberately bypasses any kind of testing, whatever, because it's only using a commit that's already been verified by the Jenkins CI, which is assumed yeah. to be doing the you know, cross-platform work, possibly work with Docker, whatever is normally defined in the Jenkins file. So it's restricted yeah just to the actual deployment step, MVN deploy. Um, you certainly could set something up like this with Jenkins. I think 
the the tricky aspect here is that we want to have some we want to have a secret that's saved per repository um, and and we can't we can't really use an organization folder the way we do on CI Jenkins IO for this purpose I think it just doesn't work in terms of the access control. That's probably something that we could develop some sort of Jenkins feature that tries to mimic the access scoping of GitHub actions in terms of picking things up per repository and also using secrets per repository mm -hmm. or getting secrets from some other store that we would have to build for that purpose. I mean, it's certainly possible. It would just be a larger implementation effort to set something up like that because of the because of the specific ways that we have this big organization with lots of repositories, each with their own contributors, and we don't want you know we don't have any kind of shared level of trust in the way um, the way the artifactory permissions are scoped per repository as well. So it's, it's set up so that you can only, you know, use your secret to deploy to your space in Artifactory. Mm -hmm. so, and it's also making other assumptions about the particular version scheme and so on. So a bunch of the point was to not use Maven release plugin, which has its own complications in terms of pushing extra commits and non-atomic flow and all of this kind of thing. So there are lots of other approaches you can take with or without Maven release plugin with different kinds of automation systems to actually do the deployment. This was simply the thing that was literally easiest to get up and running with as quickly as possible because the only infrastructure from the Jenkins project that it needs is the tool Daniel wrote to provision an artifactory secret per repository on demand. And that's something we could uh, sort of add into the updater script that we already had without, without building an entirely new thing. Mm -hmm. That's right. So yeah, while we stay on GitHub actions, um, another problem for us would be reporting because in GitHub Actions still doesn't provide uh, the full report or reporting you may expect from Jenkins. So if we are about uh, to extend pipelines, for example, uh, adding more analysis, static uh, analysis tools or even uh, dynamic testing, uh, reporting might be a concern. Uh, you can put it doesn't do any of that. That's all done by Jenkins. Mm, yeah. So I mean, I mean, you you don't even have uh, extra commits if you release this way. Um, so yeah, right. The question is, and you can attach the uh, the statuses to any commit or pull request that you have, or to the repository. So mm -hmm. this does not happen. Have to happen during the release. In fact. Um, we can run arbitrarily complex and long-running analysis uh, asynchronously, um, and that doesn't have to, you know, delay the release process. People would probably riot if their releases take two hours because we add all of the tools in there. Fair point. So, what? Yeah. How would this impact um, security releases from? a plugin maintainer and from testing of them ahead of time where those releases are normally staged in a different repo? Yeah, you can, well, I guess this hasn't come up yet because I don't think we've had any security flaws in like the three plugins that we're using it so far. Um, but I think it shouldn't, have any impact. I mean, for security releases, we still, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong, we're still doing that manually, but that would just be an MVN deploy from 
someone in the CERT team to but going to the CERT staging repository instead of public releases. But it'd right. be pretty, pretty similar. At, at the moment where all of the regular releases are done with Maven release plugin, we also do the staging with Maven release plugin, but a slightly different target. Um, the stage target plus we overwrite the destination repository and we do not push uh, the commits. So um, we have the private staging repo in Artifactory, upload the artifacts there. We have the private cert GitHub repo. Um, and at, at first we, you only have the tags and commits locally and you need to manually push them there. So um, I, we probably want a more standardized release environment than we currently have to stage. And we definitely want to continue staging because it makes release days uh, much less stressful. Um, and we would just need to adapt uh, if a plugin uses um, this, this release environment well, de independent of whether it has the CD trigger or manually triggered. Um, I think we, we can probably pass uh, the necessary command line arguments to have a similar looking release that we can end up publishing. One of the potential concerns here is, however, um, the potential for having conflicts, especially in the version history. Um, right now, we ask maintainers during the staging uh, period to not really create new releases of their plugin, um, which, I mean, they need to do a few st uh, steps to be able to release at the moment. I would expect it to be uh, slightly more common uh, for them to perhaps uh, accidentally merge a pull request that looks good uh, during that period and create a release. So um, the pattern of version numbers needs to be such that we can have a reliable way uh, to not end up with conflicts there, perhaps. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I don't think, yeah, it's, it's definitely true that you would, you would have to either remember to disable the automatic trigger or just hold off on merging pull requests for a few days. That's something we should think about. I think the, the actual process should be slightly simpler because we don't have we don't have the weird situation that we do with Maven release plugin of us having staged um, you know prepare for release prepare for next development version commits in the cert repo that are there just to produce a version that you then have to merge with uh, with stuff in the public master branch. Um, so it should be, that part should be somewhat simpler. I mean, you would just be pushing the actual security fix commit to the public repo and merging it into the current head, or it would be a fast forward merge if there were no other commits in trunk at that point. Um, I mean, as far as the version number, it just, it just encodes what the Git history looks like, which is independent of where that history was built. So if it's, you know, so if you haven't done anything new in the public master, then the stage version is guaranteed to be newer. And if you have done something else in the public master, or well, it's the same as the current situation when you, except it's a little bit easier maybe because once you merge in the security commit on top of that, that will generate a new release, which includes the, the public changes from the past few days, plus the security fix also. And there's basically a ran essentially random ordering between the staged security fix plus one additional uh, and the one additional non-security release in public because it distinguishes by the SHA. 
yeah, yeah. If you're get if you're get history branches, then then there is no total order, right, between the two branches. So you can't decide which version is newer than another. I mean, right. you, it's possible to override the the version prefix when you're staging to cert if that was useful for some reason. Uh, the prefix not because we need the sorting to work out with the update sites unless we override how lib version number works. Well, you can override the prefix in the command line. But that in itself isn't going to help because when the security vulnerability is announced, people that have already upgraded who have got a new plugin that had been merged to, to master that don't have that security fix can't upgrade to that security version because they'll end up having an older one or an incompatible one. They'll have to wait for a release that hasn't yet happened. Yeah. Right. So basically, it, yeah, it, it already happens today. So for example, if a if a plugin is on version five and we create the security fix 5.1 and at the same time version six is created, uh, we will also need to create version 6.1 or version seven with the security fix afterwards. Um, and, but uh, Jesse brings up the inclusion of the shard checksum in the version number, which prevents collisions with almost uh, certainty because uh, the security fix will necessarily have a different uh, checksum than whatever uh, release is done in public at the same time. So that sh uh, is, is actually less of a problem than it is today. The only problem is that we make uh, that it is much easier to get into this situation through uh, accidental merges. Yeah, I think we would probably want to just include in the security checklist for maintainers disable, you know, disable the manual push <laughs> or disable yeah. the automatic. Yeah, the, the the checklist that they currently follow greatly today. <laughs> <laughs> Can it's, I just have one question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Go on. I, I was just wondering what prevents us to use basically Jenkins instead of the GitHub action workflow is the way we manage credentials, right? Is it something that could be simplified if we have a specific Jenkins instance with GCAS configured? So we would not consider CI.jenkins.io, but it's a plugins.jenkins, uh, plugins.ci.jenkins.io, where people could provide their own credential. Well, are you running their own credentials? Sorry, it's not actually your own credentials. We we create credentials scope to that repository only, so it's better than personal credentials. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you could build something like this. I mean, we've, as far as I can tell, Olivier, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm surprised that you're bringing this up, and I understand the optics of it that Oleg mentioned to some degree, but we are shedding whatever services we can uh, um, because the infra team is so small and already overloaded. And now we're saying, well, let's just host another Jenkins instance to which I'm responding, yeah, in a second VPN because it's not going to be public. And it's also not going in the same VPN as everything else that we have. Um, and so I'm really the, surprised. The, 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 no, 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 no. So basically the reason why I was mentioning the, the GCAS can config is because you can easily isolate that and allow other people to manage the PRs. I mean, if you take the example of CI to Jenkins, you rely on the infra team to, to do the changes. But for instance, in the case of release at CI, um, just people who have access to the Git repository can manage the service. So that's why I was suggesting to, to another service. I mean, I, I'm not saying that we have to, to do that. Um, I'm just thinking. I mean, there are other two problems. There are other problems too. So, if you have it behind a VPN, then how do you expose the logs to the plugin maintainer in case it goes wrong, for example? It's 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 already available with the GitHub API. So you already have that information in the the yeah you know in, in a PR, for instance. Well, so, we need yeah. information. We're we're releasing, so we don't have a PR. There's yep. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. 
but that is uh, much less accessible. And if the status is linked to a hidden VPN, a private uh, a Jenkins instance, we would need to grant at least the maintainer's access to that. But Additionally, at, even if we if we find a good solution to the um, fine grained uh, authentication, uh, like we currently attach to individual repositories, uh, those audio factory access tokens, um, we also need to consider. Um, if we if if it's an instance that's supposed uh, to be accessible to maintainers, we need to maintain the VPN access to hundreds. Yeah, of I see. A, and so I see the point. And if, I, if you have several tones on top, yeah. I think there's a misunderstanding because the GitHub Checks API, and Jesse will correct me here if I'm wrong, doesn't work on pull requests. It works on commits, so you can push a, a check response for the release process to the commits that you are trying to release that will then be visible in the GitHub API on the checks tab for that commit. Yeah, this is, yeah, that would be the most straightforward way to do it. So that there's no need to access Jenkins to see, Ooh. well, if you need all the logs, then probably you will, but if you just need like uh, the last, however many bits of logs, then that should work. And at the end of the day, if there's nothing secure in the logs, because we're hopefully masking all the secrets correctly, we could always just dump them in a gist and link the gist to the pull request. It's extra work, um, but it, it's, it's I think, a, a solvable issue. Okay, that's good to know. So, but um, the, the, what, what, what I also wanted to mention is, it's not just uh, managing access, it's also administering the, the instance. Um, the service room. Uh, yeah, what what I mean by that is if I look at pull requests to core or various plugins, I occasionally see failing builds and then I jump to Jenkins and it's, well, the connection between the controller and the agent broke and um, that's pretty annoying. In the worst case, someone will need to troubleshoot that and that someone's going to be Olivier who has a bunch of free time on his hands. It's, it's incredible. And so that's, that's another concern, right? Um, there's, there's just more work that we would need to do for a very simple process otherwise, because I mean, I, I like Jenkins, I like pipeline, but those it's, it's not necessary for the like one maven deploy command that we need yeah i mean actually half of the pipeline if you want to call it that is running release drafter packaged as a github action the deploy part is actually sort of this well yeah i mean it runs mvn deploy and then it and then it uses github cli using the github action token that you get for free with github action that so half of the deploy script is running GitHub CLI to do stuff in GitHub, like manipulating the release and so on. So the the deployment to Artifactory is a single line of this process. So most of the rest is really pretty normal usage of GitHub Actions for automating things in GitHub. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know what to what to say. I, it's just that we've been discussing trying to provide some kind of CD for plugins or non-developer laptop-based deployment of plugins for several years, and nobody had time to do anything about it. The advantage of this is just that it uses some pieces that we already had lying around, basically, with relatively relatively small piece of infrastructure, which is the secret provisioning. Mm -hmm. Quick question, guys. Is the idea to improve J uh, JAP 229 with all these with all these ideas being written down? Uh, they should be written down, maybe not enough of the context. 
I mean, it really depends on what the outcome of this uh, discussion is. If it's ultimately chip 229 can do the things and we just need an extra paragraph that also acknowledges, yeah, we don't, you can configure your repository to not uh, release on merge. Um, then that's a possible outcome if we decide to go an entirely different way. Uh, I see JEP 235 or whatever uh, coming up with a separate proposal. Sorry, what's JEP 235? Whatever the next oh, oh, free JEP number is. Cool. Okay, great. Yep. Basically, uh, uh, I meant to say, yeah, when we if if we were to go in a completely different way. I would uh, rather start from two to nine, at least uh, to get it running. I have reservations about using GitHub Actions. I, at the same time, I, we can probably duplicate the flow on a similar uh, Jenkins instance easily. Uh, but yeah, technically, even if it's a GitHub Action, I will be experimented that it should be okay so yeah, basically think... my basically my, my concern about duplicating mm -hmm. on the jenkins um that's that's a point that daniel raised um if we have several um i mean hundreds of people who want to release something this means that we have less time to maintain jenkins um yeah if it's if it's already i mean if the jenkins is a pretty busy um instance um it's just harder to work on it so maybe maybe GitHub action may be most more more reliable considering the amount of people that would be able to maintain that service. I mean it's doing a lot less than the Jenkins builds are doing. The release usually runs in a minute or so because yeah, you know, because it's not doing any kind of test steps, so it's not running user provided code normally, other than Maven plugins. Um, so it's basically just doing, you know, downloading dependencies and doing a Maven package and then uploading and exiting. So there's, and it doesn't need branches or anything like that. So it's probably reliable enough, I guess. At least I haven't seen any problems so far. There is an annoyance that, um, as far as I can tell, this is just limitation of, or multiple limitations of GitHub Actions is that one, you can't, you can set the, so it doesn't use a push trigger, it actually uses a trigger on successful check because it's waiting for Jenkins, not just for the push, but for Jenkins to validate the push. Um, you can set up the trigger to be activated when there's a successful check, but you can't say which, or you can set up the trigger to activate when there is a check, but you can't say which one I think it is. Um, and so it actually runs a bunch of times and then each time says, oh no, this is not the check I was looking for and exits. And all of those exits show up as failed builds because there's no way to mark it as skipped or aborted or something like that, like you can in Jenkins. Um, and the same if you have a push that had, um, you know, only dependency updates or something like that, it goes halfway through, decides there's nothing interesting to release. And then ha the only thing it can do is mark itself as failed. So it looks ugly in the actions tab, um, but I don't know if any better way to do it. It's just not expressive enough. But as long as you're not paying attention to that, it works. So what I'm hearing is there are actually um, reasons to think about alternative approaches other than we're the Jenkins project, so we should use Jenkins for it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, well, it's convenient. The use of GitHub Actions is convenient because we're integrating release drafter and because we have the GitHub API token. Um, so you get a special 
like a temporary token associated with each action run that you can use for write operations. Yeah, this uh, which, is the biggest advantage. Yeah, which we used actually uh, published the um, the release in the check in the GitHub releases page. So that part would be hard to replicate because I don't think you can do that from an outside tool. Um, yeah, there doesn't provide the same EPA. Uh, at the last uh, GitHub universe, uh, the, the questions asked about the product managers. No, no plans. Which, yeah, helps with looking. See, if you wanted, we could, of course, uh, run a Jenkins pipeline within GitHub Actions using Jenkins file runner uh, or whatever else solution, but I'm not sure whether it provides any benefit in this case. No, because it's not it's not supposed to be user contributed build steps or anything. It's literally just MVN deploy. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there is no Gradle support in this currently, I suppose. Oh, Gradle. Gradle would be another topic entirely. You'd have to come up with something else. I don't think you could use much of this for Gradle. This is definitely made in specific assumptions here, at least about the version handling and all of that. Yeah, we have around 50 plugins using Gradle at the moment. So, well, it's quite a big chunk. I thought we were up to 100 or so. No. I can check, but yeah, I thought it's about 50. So, a quick search for build.gradle shows 74 matches, but not all of those are actual build.gradle files. So, mm -hmm. How many of them also have a palm.xml? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't actually be unhappy if we this basically ended up deprecating Gradle support because Gradle writes invalid palms anyway. And that's really annoying to consume with tools that process all of the plugins and stuff like that. Invalid palms? Uh, yeah, they still have uh, the, the assumption around the old plugin parent POM that is versioned like core. Okay. It, it just writes whatever a, an XML string inserts the core dependency and calls yeah. it a day, basically. Uh, the JPI plugin or something? I, I think so, yeah. So that's, that's really annoying. And I wouldn't be too un unhappy if there was less of that. It also took them forever to add support for uh, staging repos. Um, so that was another complication. Obviously, I'm the only one who cares about that. And no, no plugin compat tester support. Also. Well, it's a standalone tool. Um, there were some patches which allow uh, to use a PCT in principle. Um, but yeah, somebody would still need to implement that. No, uh, until recently it didn't check uh, at restricted either. So there are, there are a few standards sort of that, that we have in the project that are basically just never made it into the Gradle tooling. Obviously, we don't use it. And so the maintainer is basically on his own there. Um, but so, yeah. Have we officially? We de supported Ruby plugins now. We didn't. We have a <laughs> for that, but we have never uh, accepted that. So, so, yeah, so, so there's Ruby to add into the mix as well. For uh, not, I, I don't know when plugin. the last time someone released a Ruby plugin was, but. Yeah, they don't even work anymore, I think. <laughs> 
I think we still have allow list entries for them. So yeah, mm. that uh, I think Oleg and I, if I remember correctly, had a disagreement about how this should be rolled out, and I simply didn't have the time to do it um, uh, properly. Yeah, maybe um, we could maybe we could resurrect this. It shouldn't take too long to finally kill the Ruby plugins. Right. Um, GitLab hook still doesn't have the security fix, um, and that was by far the most popular one. So that would be doable. Um, still, um, I think we should get back to topic. I think it would be reasonable for us to start this with Maven support only, um, and look into Gradle support later, or just say, well, if you want this, you're going to have to build your plugin with Maven. Yeah, I mean, some of the infrastructure, I suppose you could reuse. You would need to have a different action for the deployment, obviously, because, because it does MVN deploy. But I suppose you could reuse the artifactory secret injection. You could reuse the stuff that does the, you know, that does the check for the the Jenkins CI status and release drafter and all of that. So it would probably be something that could be built by people interested in Gradle tooling with some of the pieces we have. I'm not going to do it. Nick. I, I have no idea how, what the equivalent in Gradle land is of Maven release plugin and how releases are normally cut, though. If there's some kind of similar plugin. Well, we can also that we uh, don't use it anyway for the continuous delivery flow. So it will be basically just a deployment uh, step in Gradle. And it's quite straightforward. So. Uh, we haven't talked about Jenkins core components at all. Um, as far as I know, the same system can be used for any core components other than parent bombs. So. Um, question there, how do we do backports? Yeah, backports uh, for security releases or for LTS needs? Um, I mean, either. I, I mean, backports typically come up in the context of security updates. Uh, for example, when the weekly has a different version of stapler than uh, the LTS line. Um, now, if we were to uh, use this release process for stapler or whatever, like, I mean, remoting is also a candidate, okay. um, whatever library we have to patch and the versions have diverged, um, how do the backwards work? Is, is it just a matter of, well, we specify the full version in the POM, so it doesn't matter how the version sort order looks like? We just need to know that one is the main line and the other is the backport. I think uh, it could be done uh, through whatever branching policy, uh, because you can uh, define a branch pattern for backports. And you can say that if you follow this branch pattern, okay, you will still get continuous delivery for this branch. No, I, don't... I specifically mean the version number. Uh, the version number is the, num the distance to the root commit plus, okay, Jesse, you explain. Um, so there's a version number, well, there's, there's two things. There's the version number and there's the uh, change list pattern that gets injected for each commit. Um, and the change list, pattern you normally set to rev count dot hash. Um, 
and sort of in the default default trunk flow for a plugin that doesn't have any special needs, the recommendation is to also use that same string as the version number of the whole component. But you can also customize that so you have some sort of prefix before that, which we're actually doing in the JJWT API plugin. Um, so for that plugin, which is a library wrapper around Java JSON web token API, um, the primary component of the version number is the version number of the upstream library. And it's actually defined in such a way in the palm that the dependency in the upstream library is picking up the same property. And then the, the Jenkins plugin packaging portion is like a sub micro or whatever portion after that. So I think you can do the same thing for backports. I just haven't tried it yet that in, if you're cutting a backport branch from a particular trunk branch point, you know, so you have a bunch of trunk commits going and then you have a particular trunk release that you want to use as a base for backports. I think you could use that, that trunk rev count number as sort of the major portion that you branch off of and then add, add your regular you know, change list.hash onto that base. So it would work the same way as what we normally do where we have, you know, 2.1.1 is, is a backport okay. fixes on top of 2.1, that kind of system. Or, you know, uh, to make sure, you know, uh, that the, the ordering works, we can also do uh, trunk count dot trunk hash. And then another separator, actual count, actual hash. You can't do it in Git because there's no notion of what trunk is. Well, that would be the manually provided one because yeah. I know which release I uh, branch off of to do the backport. Yeah. So I can use the entire version string, including the hash as the prefix there. Okay, so this is basically we, we can we can uh, overwrite this even in the default case that we see in log CLI. In what CLI? Log CLI, the oh, plug. Right. I believe so. Again, I just haven't tried it yet because we just haven't come across a case where something needed to be backported. But yeah, that's something I could prototype and make sure it works out correctly. Um, just because we, this came up with using Jenkins for this, would, what would need to be different in this process, uh, for it to be hosted inside Jenkins? Because, um, we would still use GitHub releases because we like them apparently. The version pattern would be the same because that's the same thing. We would still not use Maven release plugin. Um, we would probably have some sort of marker file in the repo rather than a GitHub action um, and go from there, right? So if we were to decide, well, we want to host it ourselves because there are benefits to doing that, um, we could essentially uh, migrate all plugins off of what they're currently doing by replacing the GitHub action uh, definition uh, in the repo with whatever would configure the corresponding process inside Jenkins. Yeah, in that, in that case, I guess, rather than having an artifactory secret uploaded to the repository, all the secret handling would be a private implementation detail of our trusted system. I mean, maybe it would just have a single, no, it would still, it would still have to have a per repository secret for safety, but it wouldn't have to ever be 
save to the repository as a GitHub secret. It would just be stored. Right. You, would, you would have to have um, GitHub write permission to the repository from this process in order to run release drafter and publish the release. And then you would have to do the physical deployment step would have to be done inside um, inside a container in some sort of isolated environment that's just given a checkout of the right commit of the source code and the and the specific artifact array token. And it doesn't it doesn't need to be user pluggable code. It's just a stock command that it runs. But you have to do it inside a container because because it is you know running whatever mojos and stuff are part of the palm definition, so you can't trust that step. But yeah, it would be possible. You would yeah, you'd have to have some sort of marker for repository, or perhaps it would be like currently in. RPU, we have the CD enabled equal true. Maybe this is something that we would put into RPU rather than marking it in the repository. I'm not sure. But another another problem with that though is what is the the trigger, right? So with GitHub Actions, you know, you have the choice of either doing the manual trigger, and we don't need to build the GUI for that. It's just part of the GitHub Actions GUI. And authentication that someone with right permission to the repository automatically gets the ability to run that action. Um, and if you were doing this elsewhere, then you would have to come up with some other means of doing a manual trigger. And even for the automate for the automated trigger, I guess you would. I guess you could get webhook events from GitHub. So that's less of a problem. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it just seems like GitHub does, does basically not allow uh, it to easily leave their action ecosystem. Many things could be replicated elsewhere, including running GitHub action uh, from the interface. Uh, but yet tokens um, and triggers, uh, they would be more complicated. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think this is the question of triggering was one of the problems that we always had when thinking about CD for plugins. We could never figure out a good way to authenticate a manual trigger. That's less of an issue in JEP 229 since you normally can use an automated trigger, especially with the with the trick that looks for interesting changes in the release draft. Um, but I think you still really want to have the option of man manual trigger. And especially for backport branches, I think those you don't want. Um, an automatic trigger on those. I think you would want a um, only manual trigger for backwards. Manual trigger could be implemented just as a tag push. As a what? Oh, a tag. So you, yeah. yeah. Maybe. I mean, that's one of the possibilities we long discussed for plugin CD, but I don't think we ever came up with a exact proposal that would work. There were some ideas there. I mean, basically a big part of the, the reason for GitHub Actions is not because it's some sort of advanced CI system, it's because it's integrated into the GitHub permissions model, basically. That's what makes this easier.
so from my point of view, I think it's uh, JEP 229, um, perhaps with a few modifications to make it easier to get started uh, for existing uh, or to make it easier to transition. Because personally, I would be sort of wary of a new process that automatically kicks off whenever I merge something and perhaps have not uh, labeled the pull request adequately. So um, we, sh we might want to be mindful of uh, people who don't want to immediately hand off uh, everything to a fully automated process. But otherwise, I think this is this is a great design and, and, and we, uh, we could adapt it more or we should adopt it more widely. Yeah, I mean, so I think Probably one of the obstacles is that is a change in version format, and that's and people don't like change. Basically, I already had one complaint about. Um, also, the new uh, format is just human unfriendly. So, if you want uh, to send a version to your fellow admin on another side of the Slack, you would need to copy paste it. Well, the, the portion that is actually interpreted for purposes of comparison is usually just an integer, actually. So it's like- So, so we're basically adopting browser versioning. Hmm. Yeah. So I've already had one complaint actually from file parameters plugin. Someone, you can go look up the issue, but um, someone said that they had an unnamed, they work for a large company and they had an unnamed internal repository from an unnamed vendor that had some sort of version parsing, parsing script that didn't like that version. And, you know, I wasn't sure what to say. It's parsed by Maven, fine. <laughs> so, and it's parsed by Jenkins, fine, but it wasn't parsed by that system. Sounds, so, sounds like they reached out to the wrong vendor there. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I don't know. Um, but yeah, those sorts of things will happen. I, I, you can use kind of Semver-like versioning if you want to. You're, it's, up, it's up to you in that case to increment the major and minor portions when you think it's appropriate. That would be git commits to change those portions. You could you could use the automatic piece as the patch component. I suppose it would be. Um, I don't have too strong opinion. I feel like for most plugins, it probably doesn't matter. You know, the point is just to push updates, not to not to convey meaning exactly. But some people are going to feel differently. So yeah, I, I think there would be pushback on the version numbers. I don't know. Well, I mean, if as long as there's the option for people to stay in their 1.2.3 point, yeah. now there's your auto-generated stuff uh, world, I think that would be a viable uh, solution uh, because there's no going back from version 150 to um, single digits. Uh, based on version math. I mean, yeah, you could start, you could start at a thousand dot one or something, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you go uh, normal ver classic version numbers, browser versions, and then you have just years. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be, it would be more visible if we were using this for Jenkins core components, maybe. I don't know. If, Maybe not. Maybe nobody pays attention to the version number anyway. No, I, I doubt it. So, um, I mean, core itself, uh, there's a conversation on the dev list, I believe, to have um, date-based versioning or some other sort of versioning that ultimately that originally came from we're doing so many changes and we're still 2.x. But for the components, meaning stapler remoting and so on, nobody even sees them unless they keep clicking on about Jenkins to see the license information, and nobody does that. So well, re remoting, you would see if you're managing static agents. Ah, okay, yeah. 
still, um, it's not really all that visible. Even 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 uh, SSH build agents don't. It doesn't really matter there. Maybe it's exposed, but you, since you transfer it via SSH every time, you don't need to worry about the version as much. Still, um, back to topic. Um, do we need to discuss the implementation of the CD or perhaps manually triggered CD of of developers outside of developer laptops uh, some more, or are we largely in agreement? I think we're in agreement. Sorry, could you repeat that, please? I think uh, that yeah, we have a consensus. So basically, job two to nine with a few extensions. Okay. Um, so next topic with the checks. Or how do you want to proceed, Oleg? Um, yeah, so I guess this topic would be completely separate because if we take uh, uh, agree that there is CI pipeline and there is CD pipeline, then yeah, all we have here is about CI pipeline. Except for the last bullet point about signing. Sign, yeah. One may ask uh, why we test uh, artifacts uh, different from what we actually ship, but in principle, we do the same for uh, other million flows. So for us, one of the concerns was about tooling. Currently, in the, during the build, we run um, uh, some static analysis tools like Spotbox, uh, Animal Sniffer, and a few other enforcer checks. Uh, but we don't really um, uh, invoke uh, security scanning. So how is current security scanning implemented? If you have dependable bot enabled, yes, uh, dependable bots infrastructure verifies um, dependencies and uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, adds a notice for you as a maintainer, so you can update. But it's not part of the um, CI CD pipeline. So it's uh, basically a standalone process. And what could be done, uh, there are existing tools like a WASP dependency check, which can uh, verify um, uh, dependencies when you actually run the build. And pretty much the same, uh, there are additional static analysis tools. For example, Jeff Thompson last year integrated uh, FindSec bugs uh, into the build flow, but there are more um, security analysis tools. And we could actually um, expand uh, this tooling um, so that um, uh, we can uh, get better checks and maybe discover additional issues uh, uh, when uh, processing couple requests and when building the, the plugins. And, uh, so, yeah. yeah, so um, since, I mean, it, it comes up in the release pipeline topic because it makes some sense to ensure that we don't ship um, completely broken and unsafe uh, software. And I mean, this is to an extent the problem in the project, uh, which we can see uh, if we look at the security advisories. I'm not a huge fan of uh, failing builds or even failing releases um, when static analysis um, finds problems. Um, especially if those are sort of time dependent processes. So if I built something yesterday and it passed and someone published the CVE and the same thing from yesterday built today will fail um, and, and, and perhaps even prohibit the release, I think that would be a problem. Uh, even, even maintainers uh, who accept um, the results of such scanners will be uh, annoyed by not being able to perhaps it not perhaps even not being able to ship a hotfix for a bug because the dependency got a CVE and it's just the same dependency as it was yesterday. Um, and it's JUnit, 
<laughs> and it's JUnit with the local file uh, inclusion thing. Yeah. Um, so we sh the the pipelines that we build, and I'm definitely for adding more scanners. Uh, for example, in the Jenkins file based CI, um, should not fail the build, but just use the builds as an opportunity to trigger themselves. Um, so we can uh, add more scanners, more results, but perhaps uh, not completely fail, block releases and such, which uh, based on the GitHub statuses is a problem because you cannot have a successful stat uh, 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 PR build status if uh, the scanners say no. So we need, would need to separate those out. There's the uh, the actual build and there's perhaps other statuses. I think it's, well, yeah. I, it might be okay to mark a separate check in, in a pull request as failed under these conditions, even if the CI check passes, I don't know. Right. You have also the possibility to just create a comment inside the pull request saying that dependency addition include also some vulnerabilities and things like that. Like it's the case for some coverage or quality plugins. Yeah, and checks also, by the way, allows you to create a status that is neutral. So it doesn't, it doesn't count as a failed status for the Full pull request, but you can still have a status that appears that's not positive that includes a warning message in it. Something that would show up, I guess. Yeah, um, I think that would be uh, great. Um, I'm just thinking whenever whenever the topic comes up, adding more checks to the builds. I'm thinking of all the plugins that disable and check the tests because the maintainers didn't bother figuring out what broke. And then you have these really trivial things that should be in no Jenkins plugin getting through. Um, additionally, um, there's, there's a problem perhaps, depending on the scanners, how they work, um, if they need configuration through the plugin POM um, or are a part of the Jenkins test harness, like the injected test is, then that relies on the maintainers uh, regularly advancing the version numbers of the build tooling. Um, the other potential way to implement uh, security scans is the one um, where the scanner is essentially completely separate from the source code, like for the CodeQL or Jenkins security scan that I've been working on uh, over the past few months uh, on and off. Um, that's just a completely separate process that also runs a build, but is not part of the regular build and just attaches metadata to the GitHub repository which seems far friendlier to plugins where they don't get the new parent POM updated every month because we can improve the scanner and update the scanner without having to update 1500 uh, plugin POMs. And if I remember right, GitHub added some way whereby third party tools could inject warnings that are visible only to repository owners. Um, yes, that's basically what the GitHub uh, or the, the Jenkins security scan that I'm working on is already doing in a very limited capacity. Uh, since I'm not integrating with GitHub uh, actions yet, um, what I do is I check out the repo, do the scan on the master branch, and then attach the warnings to the repo and it shows up in the security tab of the repository. If this would run via GitHub Actions, uh, which is definitely my plan, then that would be part of the checks of GitHub pull requests. And uh, that isn't limited to CodeQL. Uh, basically, any 
tool, I guess, could be wrapped um, so that it uh, reports its output in a way that can be consumed rather easily on GitHub. Well, but there's a difference between the code QL stuff that shows up only to the repository owners versus checks that are going to appear to the public. Right. Since I haven't done this integration step yet, I don't know whether it's possible to have security scans that only show for maintainers. Um, but the, the, the GitHub CodeQL docs should should tell us how it works for the general CodeQL case. Uh, what I've basically done is I've taken the CodeQL scanning library and forked it and invoke that manually rather than through GitHub Actions. So everything, so the value provided by the uh, GitHub Actions integration is not something that we currently have. I mean, my point is that if there's, if you introduce something wrong in a pull request, then you want that flaw to appear in a check in the pull request so it can be corrected. But if there was something already wrong in the master branch, you want to display that only to the maintainer, ideally. Right. So what GitHub does uh, is it tracks uh, code changes over time. So I expect if you have the action for the master branch commit and you uh, compare the result of that to the action that's running on the pull request head, you probably only get the diff. That's how I would do it. Um, and that's how I expect them to filter the relevant findings for pull requests. Okay. And do you also plan to have some maintainer report for master? I mean, that already exists. That's the thing that I'm doing at the moment. Okay. So I only scan master and this is made visible to maintainers only in the security tab. And the benefit there is also maintainers don't have to change the code to make the warnings disappear, that it can be managed through the GitHub UI. At least in my opinion, it's a benefit because I, I ignore the, I, I dislike all of the ignore warnings annotations in the code that may be obsolete years down the road anyway. No, I would actually say the opposite. <laughs> I'd rather have the explicit annotation somewhere than have than use a GUI to dismiss warnings. Perhaps, perhaps a matter of how many tools and how frequently the tools change. Because if um, that happens asynchronously with your code updates, like the independent code QL scan does, and all that that happens is you need to amend the code again and again, who knows? But yeah, uh, still it's it's fairly convenient to get rid of findings, um, which means I'm actually pretty, personally I'm pretty okay with false positives because they are so easy to dismiss. Which makes, you know, even, even with medium, medium confidence findings, a uh, reasonable uh, compromise. Yeah, I, I'm just saying from my experience with the the code QL checks versus say find bugs warnings that from a developer perspective, it was much more comfortable to evaluate and then fix or dismiss find bugs warnings because it's just something I can, you know, rerun locally on my source tree until there are zero warnings left. However, I deal with it and then commit and that's the and that's the fix for the warnings versus the code QL things. They had to go around and go through in the GUI. And it wasn't exactly clear whether a warning would pop up again if I refactored some things and just moved the same code to a different place. Uh, it was you know kind of hard to see what had been dismissed and go back and undo that, et cetera. OK, uh, good point. Still. Um... I mean, we, we don't need to decide on specific tools here. Um, there's probably also the topic of how suitable are they 
in terms of, I mean, OWASP dependency scan, can it handle plugin dependencies? Because if you up depend on a slightly older release of, I don't know, script security plugin, and the scanner tells you your plugin is unsafe, but it has absolutely no impact on the runtime, that's probably not the kind of scanner we want to use in the Jenkins project for plugins. Um, but the broad strokes of how scans would be integrated, uh, does that seem like we're approaching some sort of consensus? I, I've been talking so much, but nobody else says anything. I want to hear from Oleg or, you know, uh, Oh, yes. oh. From my point of view, if you are not deciding the tooling right now, it's perfectly fine. There are so many different scanners there. It could be just a nightmare if we want to dig into the detail there. Maybe we could just discuss uh, tools which are currently at our disposal, so which we can uh, use basically at short notice. And this list is not infinite. So yeah, there is CodeQL, uh, Daniel discussed. There are um, multiple analysis tools like a WASP dependency check, uh, finds and bugs. We have also access to Sneak as a part of um, uh, Linux Foundation, uh, which we can use. And well, uh, that's basically it. Just in general, Sneak is free for open source. So no need to pass to the by the foundation or things like that. You can also add um, SonarCube because they are also providing some security scan. It's not exactly the same kind of code because it's mainly checking the code and not just the composition analysis like was for Sneak. That could be potentially useful, perhaps in addition to find sec bugs, not sure exactly, but they are just including also some uh, security scan in addition. Okay. But you have other scanners that are possible to use for open source uh, code in general. Not sure exactly about the list, but I think at least two or three other are possible. And anything that works on binaries rather than source code, I guess it would have to be invoked either as part of the plugin build itself or as a downstream check or something, right? Because the the rules for what physically get packaged into the HPI are kind of complicated and they've actually changed in the past few months. So deciding like what actually makes it into webinf lib is not, not so easy to predict. You can't just look at the palm with simple rules. You actually, it's, you really need to build the HPI and then scan that if you're doing a binary check or a dependency check or something. Well, uh, in such case, um, it's applicable only to a subset of tools. Right. So yeah, you can use SonarCube for such scan. You can uh, probably use Sneak for scan of jars directly, uh, but definitely not a WASP dependency check and other tools which uh, operate with uh, the dependency trees. Also something to mention in that topic, even if a lib that is included in the HPI is never used at runtime, some scanners are discovering it, finding vulnerabilities, and so blocking the production deployment for some user of Jenkins. So is it something we also want to cover, meaning not pure security, but also security safety sentiment from different users, meaning that for security point of view, there is no need, to change some of the things there, but for some customer that will have an impact on their deployment possibility, I will say. Uh, would something be packaged but not used? I mean, that will show up as a, as part of the HPI colon package, I think it is. It will print a list of all of the jars it's including and it uses warning label for transitive dependencies. But I would say if you're packaging something that you're not using and that has a security vulnerability, then maybe you should fix that. Yeah. I don't think it's too common though. Well, uh, in some cases, mm -hmm. um, there are platform specific bits uh, being packaged. 
So for example, you may have a DLL resource, which is used on the on Windows. And for example, we have such example uh, in Jenkins, Windows Process Management Library. There are two DLLs packaged and they're used on a specific platform. Well, but that's, this is something that the users of the software will need to evaluate whether they can safely ignore a potential warning for the developers that is still a dependency problem. I mean, there, there might be dependency problems like uh, Guava has um, giant is a giant library and there's like two classes that have very specific vulnerabilities and they're used nowhere in Jenkins. So um, I would not fault people too much for ignoring that for a while or you know, lowering the priority of the work to, to update that library. But um, otherwise, it's something that will need to be evaluated. And only if it's something that only affects specific users and environments, um, that's up to the uh, users or admins to decide whether they, they can ignore it or not. As the developers, by default, it's not obviously safe to continue shipping it. To that point, would it be good just to leave it up to the users as an option? Sorry, could you elaborate? Uh, this use of the tool scanning, can that be left to the user's choice and option? I mean, then they will just report it to the maintainers and complain about it. And the maintainers say, well, we don't have access to the tool. I don't know how to use it. Please go away and leave me alone. I mean, um, we that's want to- That's the situation today. Well, and it's not a great situation, right? We should, we should do our best to keep, to do things like keeping dependencies updated because people will complain if they're outdated. And so giving the plugin maintainers the tools they need to understand what users might be concerned about uh, would definitely be, be a big step forward. And um, then it's up to the maintainers to say, yeah, this looks relevant, I'm going to update it or no, this, you know, too much work, cannot do it right now and, and defer it. Ultimately, what, what we're discussing now and what, what this is a point I made earlier, I do not want to have something like a dependency check fail the release builds, right? This should not be blocking, which would only result in people opting out of having these checks entirely. This is just about providing additional information to maintainers to without them having to actively seek out the tooling and figure out how to integrate it into the builds and their environments um, so that they are given the information needed to say, well, this is a dependency I probably should update. Yeah, it's rather a question of default behavior because at some point, uh, maintainers may want to have strict checks. But I agree with you that uh, default behavior shouldn't be enforcing that, uh, as long as we can provide uh, some uh, additional uh, uh, motivation for maintainers to actually adopt these checks. Because otherwise, uh, yeah, something not enabled by default, it won't be used. Right, so you mean something like, um, I don't know, um, ex exposing exposing to, on the plugin side, whether a plugin chooses to not release something with outstanding warnings or something like that, or what do you mean? Yeah, something like, like, like that. Like adding a badge, this is a particularly high quality plugin or it successfully evaded all of the static code analysis checks. Yeah, so we can uh, send uh, stickers uh, to maintainers who enable these checks. I'm pretty sure we can find budget for that.
but uh, yeah, something along these lines. So there should be motivation to enable these checks if you want uh, to disable them by default. I mean, the thing is, I don't want to disable them, right? The checks need to okay. happen. The question is just yeah. whether you can create new releases while some checks fail. And based on what I've seen of some of the static code analysis tools, is, well, um, this check fails for no reason. You cannot read the version number. And this is, yeah. Yeah, and again, for find suck bugs or something, I think that's okay because it's either going to fail or not depending on exactly what's in your source tree. So it's not going to suddenly start failing for no clear reason. It's going to fail because you updated something or changed some code. So but that's pretty different from the code QL checks, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't talked about the recommended plugins and the setup wizard. I mean, that's one point where we can apply some level of oversight as the project at a project level to plugins, right? Yeah, unfortunately, we do not have so many plugins which would be added to recommended ones historically. Well, but we, I'm saying we could, we could start making some conditions for plugins which show up in the setup wizard, whether they're recommended by default or not, I think it doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. Just having, just for them to be listed in the, in the setup wizard or be a dependency of something that's listed in the setup wizard, there should probably be some sort of minimum baseline of compliance with these practices that we define. I agree. Obviously, if we introduce these processes now, uh, we cannot immediately start filtering because the setup wizard would look fairly empty. I mean, it would basically be, I don't know, log CLI. Um, but over time, I think we should, you know, ensure that the Jenkins that we ship by default has none of these very obvious problems. So um, I just wanted to mention um, something else related to what Jesse just said. I think it's helpful that, to think of these analysis tools being on two axes. Um, one is whether their only their output is only depending on the component itself as input, like uh, find sec bugs uh, if you configure the version of or find bugs if you configure the version of find bugs in the POM and you don't change the source code the outcome is as far as I know always the same, whereas there are other tools like OWASP dependency check I believe can run as part of your Maven build, but it contacts a CVE database of sorts and the outcome is time dependent. Um, and the other axis is whether it's part of the local build that you can run in your IDE, what Jesse said, which is particularly convenient. And the other is, well, it's from the outside in an asynchronous sort of process. And um, the asynchronous time depending one is a big one as well as the um, always consistent, only depending on your actual component con and configuration and locally run one. But something like OWASP dependency check, I would not want to add to the parent POM, enable by default and fail the build if it fails, um, because that has the bad behavior of changing whether something is buildable uh, from one day to the next. So I just wanted to make that explicit. I think there is a reasonable expectation that if it's part of something that you get from the parent POM, um, that it will not change substantially over time. Yeah, which also puts constraints on the kinds of changes you should make to the pipeline library repository. 
new new kinds of scans or things like that should be opt in at the source level, I think, if they're going to go into that, you know, build plugin pipeline. I mean, it can be part of the pipeline. It just shouldn't be part of the status, but a separate status or yeah. uh check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that possibly that too. Anyway, we will need a bunch of these tools and we can enable them uh, gradually for um, uh, consumption. The question is rather from what tools do we want to start right now? Because we have uh, CodeQL, which is mostly done by Daniel. We have tools which are already integrated in uh, parent forms. Uh, but uh, we so far don't uh, really have uh, uh, dependency scans which would uh, generate reports. The rest is the rest. I mean, if if we if we consider the two axes I just mentioned, something like a dependency scan would probably be best introduced as a GitHub action um, that mm -hmm. adds or runs as part of build plugin, but uh, only add some additional status rather than be part of the regular PR merge status. Um, or PR, is it merge? I think it's PR merge. Yep. Um, and I mean, we can, we can basically just add stuff. Um, if someone doesn't care about a new tool being added, then they don't care about it. And otherwise, it's an helpful service. I don't see why those shouldn't be opt out uh, if they don't end up failing builds. They shouldn't, mm, especially if they yeah, operate asynchronously. Because for example, for what's dependency check, yeah, it's about five minutes uh, if you don't have cache. So. Mm, that's out of the question. And for other tools like Sonar, et cetera, they also, uh, they also consume quite a lot of time. All right. So I think this, uh, as, as, as long as our chosen solutions aren't too noisy with false positives, mm -hmm. um, and this, there is, this is where we would consider, need to consider plugin dependency definitions, because I think Dependa bot struggles a bit with that. Um, there's, I see no reason not to just, you know, whichever tool looks reasonable um, to add that. I, I was going to ask, um, what, what's the difference between the OWASP dependency checks and Dependabot security checks, as opposed to Dependabot regular checks for everything, just, just having it enabled for security? Depend about uh, well, uh, it's invoked uh, outside pipeline, and uh, they use a different database of uh, CVEs. But in uh, principle, yeah. Is there any reason we haven't listed it then as a tool that we have access to? I mean, I know I know some people, some maintainers already use it on their plugin repositories. So you don't have a choice; it's active whether you. Oh, oh okay. It. Yeah, it's automatic in GitHub. If a CVE shows up in something that the Dependabot parsing algorithm would consider to be a dependency, and yes, that includes test dependencies and whatever, it's not very smart. It's just some Ruby parser of your palm.xml, basically, um, as far as I know. Then it's going to show up in your security tab if you're a repository owner. You can disable it at a repository level or, or at the org level, but yeah, but by default, that's there. Yeah, and default, that's there. on the org level, I recently made the huge mistake of clicking enable for all. Um, and that was before the 400 chain unit dependencies and plugins got the security uh, vulnerability report. So that was fun. But uh, yeah, I, I could disable it. And on an org level, we can also periodically just opt in everyone again, even if they opted out.
Right. Yeah, speaking of dependencies, yeah, we talked a lot about uh, Java dependencies, um, but uh, yeah, we have some plugins like Blotion, etc., which also include a lot of uh, JavaScript stuff. And in each cases, we have libraries including um, other jars and uh, DLLs as resources, which is probably the, the least important case. But for NPM stuff, I guess we will also need to, to invent something. Um, unless we press it with approach uh, being used by Uli Hafner when uh, each JavaScript dependency becomes a separate API plugin. Yes. Well, at least to depend about check, I think it will look for package.json or whatever it is. I've certainly seen that in proprietary plugins that I have that have got both um, JavaScript and Java. It, it picks up dependencies for all of it. I think one potential problem there is um, the JS libs approach to JavaScript libraries. But I think that's essentially long deprecated or JS builder, I think was also yeah. one of those yeah. um, approaches, but uh, I don't think those gained a lot of traction in the ecosystem. So it's not like we have hundreds of plugins uh, with this problem. Yeah, I think Uli's approach makes sense. It's the same way we package or reusable Java libraries. So. I, which I think actually doesn't make sense. It 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 mean if if there is a security vulnerability in that and there's a breaking change because we haven't updated it, or even there was a breaking change because it went from the the whoever produces that library doesn't care about backwards compatibility, which happens, then we're we're stuck in a we have to do a massive kind of fix to get everything fixed and released and not break anything, which I don't think is, is really sustainable. Um, well, you should have had Dependabot turned on to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but that, you know, when you had Dependabot turned on to begin with, it, you know, it, it, it works fine on the plugin with the API in it because it's got no test because it's an API plugin and, and Jenkins plugins, it, doesn't update the dependency elsewhere or or it does and it fails that build but the plugins already released it's in the update center someone's upgraded and boom um, i think it's, it's the um, same it's the same kind of trade off we have for java dependencies right yeah yeah Although, I maybe, maybe I, I, the JavaScript I, ones break more often. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, that there always seems to be a new shiny thing in JavaScript land. So uh, it might happen more often, but I, I don't know. Um, I have no metrics to say either way. Okay. So we are going slightly over time. Uh, should we briefly summarize uh, the results of the discussion? And, and what would be our next steps? I guess the most obvious next step is somebody to process that and uh, stop uh, action items. And, the question is rather, is anybody interested to work on uh, the tooling in short term? So I would be most interested in continuing the work that I've been doing on the Jenkins specific um, security scan, um, because there's just a lot of, you know, um, problems that many plugins have in common, um, but that are specific to Jenkins. and while something like a dependency scan superficially is probably helpful to you know make people back off with their own dependency scan results 
in terms of security benefits uh, in the actual code, I think um, doing the Jenkins specific rules uh, and rolling that out a lot more widely will probably have the best results in you know actual actually fixing security vulnerabilities in Jenkins. And taking that uh, it's already halfway done. Why not? That's generous, but thank you. <laughs> well, uh, you have a working thing. It's great. I mean, it works, and we have some rules, and we found some stuff. Um, so there, there are two directions uh, in which we can improve this. One is improve the rules that are Jenkins specific and, and publish them as well to make uh, to allow others to use them, and then properly integrate that into um, the usual GitHub pull request workflow. Because right now that is you know just a daily scan that updates metadata attached to the repo for the latest master commit. And that's not really useful once it finds something real uh, or, you know, even to scan a pull request to prevent you from introducing more problems. Oh, best use to use continuous delivery, right? You ship it and the next day you get a warning. <laughs> but yeah, I think that it's something uh, we could definitely adopt another low hanging fruit uh, for us is uh, uh, our WASP dependency check if we really want to do that though again as it was discussed it's partially replaced by dependabot so no specific uh, outcome right now and we could also um, uh, try enabling sneak uh, though well, it's actually enabled for us uh, the problem is uh, Okay. Yeah. UX is the most important thing for security. Yeah. So, but anyway, we have uh, Jen Jenkins here, so you can see that there is small number of uh, alleged yeah. vulnerabilities. That Where was, did they get ten thousand repos from? Don't ask. Uh, no, actually, total repos is uh, to seven three four seven. That's correct. Uh, okay, cool. So two hundred thirty thousand findings, of which eight are fixable. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these buttons used to work. Now they don't. So uh, let's wait until uh, they actually fix it. Uh, but yeah, before that, it was possible to go to sneak and uh, to explore plugins, uh, etc. And actually, as you may imagine, uh, the most of these issues come uh, through dependencies and through trends in dependency resolution. And uh, yeah, like we discovered from other tools, you just uh, have Jenkins version set to uh, Jenkins core, and then uh, the things start exploding because. You need to stop rules to ignore such things. So it's not particularly helpful as is. And if somebody wants to work on that, it would require some time. Okay. I'm looking into sneak anyway, at least to get it accessible to contributors. Um, but yeah, I definitely don't commit to stop all the rules there. Because not... So I think James, you said that sneak is free for open source. Or who said that? Not me. I might have said that, but. I'm... Don't recall. I'm not certainly not in this meeting. I might have said it before. Okay. I'm definitely sure that we can uh, get sneak for Jenkins if we want. Uh, well, we get it through the Linux Foundation anyway, and well, 
uh, we can get this next sponsorship um, because Nicole is also part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation. Uh, so, so, uh, so I, I can, mm -hmm. by the way, the same number of uh, release engineering for Linux Foundation. Um, SNCC is available via the Linux Foundation security system, right? So that's actually what they're using under the covers. So yep. you don't need to go applying to SNCC for an open source license. You get that as mm -hmm. part of LFX security. Yep. So we um, just need the, the, the reason why you're not getting into that is you need to be granted access because due to the licensing that SNCC has with the LF, we have to specifically grant sp people rights to be able to see the, the reports. Yeah, I've got that access a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So something so. changed and now you get this fancy <clears throat> warning. Oh. Uh, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I don't have any control over that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fine because uh, they needed to redesign user experience because there were some collisions between uh, Linux Foundation uh, and the Sneak uh, uh, JavaScript so that you were not able to actually scroll uh, all the issues in yeah. the uh, LFX security front end. So maybe that's what they redesigned. I'm not sure. It could be. I, I'm not part of that particular team. So, so the reason I'm asking about SNCC is um, if I look at the GitHub code scanners. So mm -hmm. I've, I've used that so far for my custom code girl rules, but this, there's a marketplace for GitHub actions that run security scans. And there is something called SNCC infrastructure as code. And that's a workflow okay. that can be set up. Is that different from this snake or is that largely the same functionality just exposed to users differently? No, it's another product. So Sneak uh, has multiple products at the moment. Okay. Um, so, so there's also Vera code static analysis. I think Oleg, you had great uh, experience with that. With Sneak? Vera code. Oh yeah, I had a great experience with that uh, when I was working on uh, embedded software. When I was working on Java, no, same thank you. Okay. Yeah, so there's a bunch of tools that mm -hmm. look like they are essentially one click and the commit to master away from being run against Jenkins plugins. Um, security. Yeah, that looks to be largely the same list. Mm -hmm. So you can see this, by the way, in every repo, if you click on the security tab and then code scanning alerts, and then you can set up actions there. So that might also be, you know, just for us to evaluate which of these tools make sense uh, and, and can handle Jenkins plugins and then recommend their use, maybe set them up by default in the plugin template. Mm -hmm. That's right, we can do that. And yeah, there is quite a number of tools. Okay, so basically, Daniel, your suggestion is to just uh, review GitHub Actions and to see what we can use from there. I mean, that would certainly have the lowest cost in terms of infrastructure we would need to operate. I agree, it would be useful. Anything else we would like to add to the list? Are there next steps we should take for CHEP 229? Just, I mean, between us, I think we're maintaining a few dozen plugins. Uh, should we just go live and see what happens? 
Yeah, well, I can verify that the backport release flow actually works. I mean, I, I guess just take some stupid plugin like log CLI and try to backport something. I don't know, make something up. But just make sure that the, the version scheme works for backports and that you can do either manual or automatic triggers or something reasonably in that mode. I, the GitHub Actions, the documentation is really vague about some triggers only apply to the default branch or they only apply when the configuration file is in the default branch or something. I can't always understand what the documentation is saying. So that needs to be tested. Um, and we can try using it on some sort of core component. I don't know. I mean, stapler would be a good candidate. The problem there is that we still don't have it inside the Jenkins CI org. So that makes, I don't know if that matters much, but it makes things a little bit more complicated. We can probably just move the stuff. And it's also currently being released to Maven Central, which would not be compatible with this. So we would need to track down the five people left in the world who are still using it for non-Jenkins projects and tell them, sorry, I don't even know how you find those people. <laughs> I'm not sure that uh, there are actually five people out there. <laughs> I don't know. But I, I mean, would, wouldn't, wouldn't it be easier to, I don't know, lib version number, something stupid like that, to Maybe. try to uh, start integrating um, that or uh, applying the, the, the new release process there and see what happens? Yeah, that just doesn't get enough. I mean, it gets like one change every five years. So whereas stapler people actually patch and are waiting for releases and things. So it seems more relevant. Well, for testing flow, we can uh, take any library. And the, uh, there is enough uh, refactoring pull requests you can create to test the flow. Yeah, Winston is another possibility. Windstone would be a good one um, if we don't want to do remoting, especially. Yeah, well, maybe hold off on remoting. I can look into Winston. Then uh, for this process, I think it would make sense to look into what the plugin template should look like. We have, I think, default workflows in the plugin template. Uh, archetype, sorry, archetype. archetype. Yeah, so well, with the archetypes, all of the hosting on Jenkins CI specific stuff is currently, it's not part of the archetype itself. It's actually injected by a um, archetype parameter. And I, I don't think we're ready at this point to turn on JEP229 by default in archetypes that seems kind of bold right but we we will need to think about what that looks like i mean it can be a completely commented out workflow file or something um but you have to it's not just the workflow file you have to have a different version format and things like that uh, okay we can uh, create uh, um, this uh, github uh, workflow just a separate repository or as a part of jenkins ci.github and reference it from there i don't think so why not because github actions <laughs> yeah i don't think it lets you do stuff like that as far as i know it doesn't have very rich reuse options you can create actions but they can't compose and you can't pull definitions from other places. They've been trying to, there are hundreds of, yeah, there are hundreds of questions about this, but no clear answers. So. I believe they created templating for organizations. Yeah, I mean, we could include all of this stuff for JEP229 in the archetype commented out. That's one option. Another option is to have another flag in the archetype. So currently there's a, 
there's a Boolean flag to include Jenkins CI GitHub specific stuff. We could have another flag to include CD. Yeah. So I think that would be useful just to get a better idea of how that would look like to maintainers. Yeah. Because I think from a technical point of view, we're there. There are already two plugins that use it in slightly different ways, at least, perhaps more. Uh, but Loxy Alliance, the JJWT uh, API I know of. File and parameters. File parameters. Um, and now the question is, how do we make this accessible to uh, maintainers who are not also you know, the authors of this thing? Yeah, and Mark Wade, I think, was going to try it on some plugin he maintains. So I can't remember which one. Platform labeler, probably. Yeah. Most likely. I believe he enabled it. We had a discussion about it two to nine several days ago. Yeah, I don't know if it's working for him or what. Let's take a look. It looks good. Version 793 point nonsense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's working. Mm -hmm. Which is a good thing. Or at least the first the first release worked, yeah. All right, so what you're saying this, is I can migrate dark theme, uh was, solarized theme. I was just gonna say, is that a valid um version number as far as Maven and everything's concerned. Shouldn't that be a dash as opposed to a dot after the 793? Yeah, Maven, Maven is happy. It's the same. It's basically the well, same. It's, 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 made, Maven's happy with anything because it goes, oh, I can't pass this. It's a string. Have, have a version number that's a string. Everything's a string. So I, I'm not meaning happy as in, can it, can it, you know, is it not going to blow up? It, I know it's not going to blow up and you can consume it and everything. It's like, is it, could you compare that to something else that happened to be, you know, or is it just going to be a string comparison? And I think a string comparison compared to something that's not a string is a little bit interesting, isn't it? For I mean, comparison purposes, it's the integer, the 793. That's the comparison. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, basically a slight variant of the incrementals version format, but we're not using the dash RC part because it's a release, not a release candidate. Basically, that's the only difference. Yeah. And that's been used in both, both the Maven version parser and the Jenkins version parser are okay with that. And it hasn't okay. caused any problems I know of. I mean, there might hypothetically be problems once we look into backports and what that version format would need to look like to be compatible here and compare correctly. Yeah, but um, yeah, but it looks like a problem that we can um, address or that we can figure out how to, and then we'll need to document it because uh, maintainers should know uh, the options that they have. Um, because I don't want anyone to say, I don't like having version 700, whatever. Um, I'm not going to use this. They should, you know, we should, we should advertise, well, if you don't like this version format, here's how you get add a one in front or two. Right. Yeah, there's some documentation about this, but right now it's not on Jenkins IO, it's in a separate repository. And it should probably be edited and cleaned up in various ways. So made into a friendlier guide. I, th I think that would be a reasonable next step for us to basically promote JEP 229 in the regular Jenkins IO developer documentation when it comes to releasing or publishing plugins. Um, and have at least a minimal introduction there plus references. Yeah. Currently, it's just a link in Jenkins.io. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, our documentation needs some move up anyway. So right now it's a bit uh, scattered. We start moving some uh, wiki documentation, etc. But yeah, from first contributor standpoint, it's hard to find uh, the bits. Um, yeah, we can actually write some publishing here. plugin. Yeah. Yeah, but what? Yeah, style guide. What is it doing here? Yeah. I added. I added like a brief mention to. Mm -hmm. Click, click the link and it will all be explained all like. Sorry? Click on style, click on style guides. Oh, okay. Plugin name information. This is important for plugin hosting. Okay. Great. So anyway, it's a separate topic. So. Yeah, we can uh, add more information there. We could uh, refactor some of the pages to make it more visible. Um, or we could just poke people in the developer mailing list, which is likely to be the most efficient way. Well, you need to do both. Yeah. I mean, you need to have a nice written guide first and then notify people of it. And I think for those of us who are maintainers, I think it would be useful if we just um, started using this in perhaps our less popular plugins. So for example, I completely forgot that I'm the maintainer of Solarize theme. Um, and I think that's a plugin that I can just use rather than, you know, matrix off. That might be a bit much as the first test run plug-in um, for it and then, you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good approach. And anyone has a few pet project plugins. So we can start from there then. Okay. Any additional actions we would like to take? Um, the documentation needs to cover both the version number formatting as well as how to uh, have manual releases via actions. I think those two might help in terms of getting uh, wider spread acceptance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's definitely something we can do. Yeah. yeah, probably we also need to do some formalities like, yeah, I'm not sure whether we even want to spend time on uh, the BDF delegate process. I wanted to finally make this part optional in the process. And I think that we should do that. Isn't, isn't that basically obsolete anyway? Uh, well, it's de facto obsolete. Because the benevolent dictator has fled the island. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Something like that. Yeah. I mean, there, there is enough of this exists, and the fact that this is not that this is basically opt in, uh, mm -hmm. that we can just you know do this more as like a grassroots thing, um, and because it doesn't need the super official stamp of approval. Yeah. So it's uh, definitely not blocking uh, rollout, but eventually we will uh, likely want to accept it. Okay. 
Okay, sure. If you figure out how to do that. <laughs> well, uh, I believe it's a part of my responsibilities always. Uh, I wanted to do it uh, during the Christmas break, uh, but yeah, it's better later than never. Okay. I have to go. Is there anything else we wanted to talk about about 229? I don't think so. And we are already over time. Yeah. So I think we can just move forward to the developer mailing list, especially for other tools which we didn't touch. So if somebody wants to explore them and to add them into the pipeline, it's a uh, good uh, area uh, because it may help uh, many other contributors. Right. I mean, especially with uh, GitHub Actions and the GitHub Marketplace and GitHub Security Scans, um, it seems like maintainers can just enable whatever checks they like. And what we need is basically a blessed or known good set of scans that aren't completely useless for Jenkins plugins due to um, us doing weird things with the palm and uh, the runtime mattering more than the declared dependencies and such. So I think we should have definitely a recommended set of uh, scans that perhaps can make it in the archetype, um, but this is also very low um, barrier uh, way for anyone in the project to contribute. Just, you know, enable this on your plugin and see what happens. Yeah. And if uh, something good happens, you can also document it and create some configuration templates. Okay. So I guess uh, that's it for today. And thanks uh, to everybody who participated in the discussion. Thanks for driving, Oleg. Thank you very much. Not that much. It was uh, you know, okay. mostly it was Jesse and Daniel today. Thanks, Oleg. Yeah. And Daniel and everyone else. Yeah. Well, so I guess uh, we'll meet again in at four. So in 45 minutes or something, isn't that a closing meeting? Mm, yeah, I guess so. All right, see you then. See you, bye. Bye-bye.